Good evening. You know, after leafing through this, I really don't have very much to say, but uh, we look forward. We look forward to this. My name is Barry Solomon. I'm the uh, chair of the School of Media Studies, and on behalf of the school and the School of Drama here at the New School, I want to welcome you this evening uh, to celebrate the uh, the publishing by Routledge Press of Judith Molina's book, The Piscator Notebook. Now, Erwin Piscator, who you will hear a lot more about soon, I'll get out of the way soon, I promise. But in 1939. He arrived here in, uh, was asked at the new school by, uh, by Alvin Johnson, uh, who was president of the school then, to found a drama workshop. And um, this after he'd moved here in 36. And at that little theater workshop, they uh, worked with an astonishing array of, of uh, students, colleagues, and uh, playwrights, including, let's see if I can get this right, Harry Belafonte, Marlon Brando, Tony Curtis, Ben Gazzara, Judith Molina, Walter Matthau, Rod Steiger, Elaine Stritch, Eli Wallach, and Tennessee Williams. A few years later, 1947, just prior, about four years prior to Piscator's return to, uh, to Germany, uh, this time out of the uh, dark shadow of McCarthy politics, Judith and her husband, Julian, founded the, uh, the Living Theater. And the rest, I guess we could say, is epic theatrical history. I would like to introduce, yes, I would like to introduce Kristen Sky Hoffman, who's going to say a few words and take us through a bit of history here. Thank you very much. Hello. <laughs> it's so nice to see everybody here. This is, this is really an amazing event, and I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, thank you, Judith, for inviting me. Uh, I have been granted the happy task of taking you through a very brief history of Erwin Piscotter. Um, oh, here we are. He's right here. <laughs> um, so I will start by uh, saying that most people who know about Piscotter know him as a teacher of Bertolt Brecht. Um, okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, for those, uh, um, so here we are. Um, and it's true that many of the achievements that Brecht had, uh, they came from Piscotter first, and it's remarkable how difficult it is to find a picture of them together. So please enjoy this. Uh, <laughs> Erwin Friedrich Maximilian Piscotter was born December 17, 1893 in Ulm, Germany. The small town of Ulm was also the birthplace of Albert Einstein. Wonder what's in the water in Ulm. <laughs> The Piscotters were a middle-class family. Oh, look at this, isn't that beautiful? Uh, they, uh, when Erwin was six years old, the family moved to Marburg, where his father, Carl, opened a clothing store. If you look at this picture, uh, Erwin and his father are down on the ground floor, and they lived in the apartment above, and that's his brother and his mother looking out of the, the, the windows there. Uh, when he was old enough, he enrolled at Munich University to study German philosophy, literature, and art history. There, he took a famous seminar on theater history from Arthur Kutcher, who, which is a seminar that Bertolt Brecht took years later. In 1914, at the age of 21, he decided he would be an actor, and he began doing unpaid extra work at the Hof Theater in Munich. That's him up in the upper right-hand corner. <clears throat> Then, in 1915, when he, at the age of 22, he was drafted into the frontline infantry in the First World War. The horrors of war he experienced put a lot of the theater work he'd done in perspective. To him, acting, theater, and art in general started to seem trivial and irrelevant in comparison. He told the story of a day where there was a lull in the fighting, and he was playing chess with his buddy in the trenches. The friend left to go relieve himself and didn't return. Piscotter went to go look for him and found him, in the, found him in the latrines with a bullet in his head. A sniper had shot him when he looked over the edge of the trench. He also witnessed soldiers going through the pockets of their fellow soldiers after they'd been killed. The senselessness and brutality of war affected him deeply. This inspired a deep-seated hatred for the military and, eventually joined the, and he eventually joined the Communist Party in 1918 when it was newly founded. In 1917, he was wounded in battle, hospitalized, and then resigned and reassigned to military, the military theater unit. When he left the military, he joined the Dada Circle, where he met writers and collaborators with whom he would work for the rest of his life. 
he was inspired to join his love of theater with his passionate disdain for war. As he grew as a director, Piscotter became fascinated with machines that could help him most efficiently tell the stories of his plays. He used revolving platforms, conveyor belts, treadmills, escalators and elevators, motorized bridges and rising and falling stage levels, shadow projections, mixed media projections, and on and on. He would amplify sound toward the audience in a way that was kind of off-putting and would use searchlights directed right on them. Uh, he believed this. He believed in completely immersing the audience in the message. Actors would come in from the audience. Projections would be sent all over the walls and ceilings, and he wanted a theater that could adhere to all of his innovations. So, one of the designers that he met when he was in the Dada Circle was Walter Gropius, who helped him conceive and design the idea for the Total Theater. They wanted to design a playhouse that was capable of serving every possible technical need while also seating 2,000 people. They did this in the, in the design for the Total Theater. It could accommodate arena, thrust, and proscenium productions by means of revolving acting space and blocks of seats that moved with it. There was a cyclorama where slides and projections could be cast at the rear of the stage as well as all around the walls and on the ceiling. Their idea was to keep the audience in the middle of the action at all times and it was never built because it was too expensive. In 1926, he directed a production of Friedrich Schiller's The Robbers in Berlin. He used this classic German text to make a case for communism. It provoked widespread controversy. Piscotter cut the text heavily and reinterpreted it as a vehicle for his political beliefs. Piscotter made the lone Jewish character, Spiegelberg, who is in the past usually villainized, uh, he made him the hero and the voice of the working class revolution. Um, in, in Spiegelberg's death scene, uh, the audience heard the Internationale sung, which was the theme of the Communist Party. In 1928, he directed The Adventures of the Good Soldier Schweck, and uh, this was based on a novel. This was uh, Piscotter's most successful production and technically his most ambitious, including treadmills and cartoon projections throughout. It was about a bumbling soldier whose foolish enthusiasm keeps messing up the military leader's war. Brecht worked dramaturgically on the production and then 15 years later adapted his own version and took it back to Germany and that was a point of contention between the two of them until Piscotter's death. All his work up to this point was creating a genre called the epic theater. The epic theater involved plays based out of existing texts or historical events. They were not sentimental, but sought to raise awareness in the audience about political issues. Epic theater is a phrase which Brecht borrowed from Piscotter in the 20s and went on defining until the end of his life. Kenneth Tynan, theater critic. In 1936, he traveled to Paris uh, when the rise of the Nazi party became too overwhelming. And it was in Paris where he met Maria Ley a dancer in Paris and Berlin. They were married in 1937, and Brecht was a groomsman. In 1939, the couple moved to New York to avoid Nazi-occupied Europe. That's him in the Rockies, and I'm from Colorado, so that's an exciting picture for me. Um, and uh, immediately, notable individuals from all over the theater community in New York started recommending him to the then President Alvin Johnson. Albert Einstein said, Mr. Erwin Piscotter has stimulated theater life in Germany and shown it new paths, as only can be said of a few others. Sinclair Lewis said, I think there is no question that of the generation of theater producers of today, he is the most brilliant, original, and yet practical. In the spring of 1939, Piscotter signed an agreement with Alvin Johnson to found a drama and acting school at the New School. The dramatic workshop started its operations in January 1940, and some 20 students joined. In September 1940, the workshop began to launch semi-professional theater productions within the Studio Theater, i.e. Tishman Auditorium, right here at 66 West 12th Street. In 1944, the dramatic workshop began to hold annual summer theaters uh, uh, theater workshops um, in resort towns such as Sayville and Lake Placid. Faculty members included Stella Adler and Lee Strasberg and his wife, Maria Leigh Piscotter. This is a photo of a uh, workshop at Lake Placid, and that handsome fellow in the middle is Marlon Brando. <laughs> and as you can see, all of the ladies are paying attention to him while Erwin tries to direct. <laughs> it's a classic photo. <laughs> 
So among his students, as, as Barry so eloquently listed, were Marlon Brando, B. Arthur, Harry Belafonte, Tony Curtis, uh, Ben Gazzaro, Walter Matthau, Elaine Stritch, Tennessee Williams, and of course, our Judith Molina. Here's a few shots of that. Tony, Harry, and the cast of the flies. All right. <clears throat> His idea when he was creating this school was that students, in order to learn how to act sufficiently, could, must learn how to do every part of the theater. And so they had to learn how to produce. And this is a philosophy, I can tell you, that is still held at the New School for Drama today. Piscotter returned, oh, I'm sorry, I'm almost finished. <laughs> he returned to West Germany in 1951 due to McCarthy era political pressure, and Maria took over running the school. Uh, to much international critical acclaim in 1963, Piscotter premiered The Deputy, a play about Pope Pius XII and the allegedly neglected rescue of Italian Jews from Nazi gas chambers. He continued to direct political theater right up until his sudden death in 1966 when he was still in rehearsals, and that is really inspirational. So I want to thank you all for uh, being here. And oh, I want to read this to you. I'm sorry. I want to share this. He put this in his program for King Lear uh, that was, was delivered right here. To an audience of ideal playgoers, you are not the casual playgoer whose criticism begins and ends with opinion after one carelessly seen performance who dismisses a play capriciously, smugly, irresponsibly with, I liked it or I did not like it at all. You have made an art of seeing, hearing, understanding. Like the music lover who studies the score of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and follows the performance with intelligence, you demand education in aesthetic experience. I know a stockbroker who learned Greek to understand classic drama in its original tongue. He went to see a play which he had read before and disliked. He did, not, he did not see it once, but 10 times. Each attendance revealed new ideas. He realized that he could not be confident of a single impression. He must have been the man whom Shakespeare said, if only one in the audience understands, then that's enough for me. Um, so thank you very much for having me. And uh, I would love to introduce one of our acting MFA candidates, Simon Winheld, who's going to read the Living Theater's mission statement to you. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. Hello, I'm Simon Winheld. It's my pleasure to read the mission statement of the Living Theater. To call into question who we are to each other in the social environment of the theater. To undo the knots that lead to misery. To spread ourselves across the public's table like platters at a banquet to set ourselves in motion like a vortex that pulls the spectator into action, to fire the body's secret engines, to pass through the prism and come out a rainbow, to insist that what happens in the jails matters, to cry not in my name at the hour of execution, to move from the theater to the street and from the street to the theater. This is what the living theater does today. It is what it has always done. Thank you. It's a remarkable experience for me uh, to be sitting here on this stage uh, where I have, uh, where I played many, many plays. In spite of the small stage, we did some big plays here. And uh, my memory of Piscotter standing here and speaking and teaching is very strong. <clears throat> and to see a group of people gathered here who care about that event is quite thrilling. And uh, I'm going to talk about my book, uh, my Piscata notebook. Uh, <coughs> we have a bad cough. Uh,
This book was actually started in 1945. Uh, that's a long time ago. Uh, in 1945, I started to work at the dramatic workshop here on 12th Street uh, <clears throat> under Piscotter's uh, formation. And uh, I kept very careful notes because I had great respect for Piscotter and I wanted to remember everything he said and everything we did in the school. So I kept a very strict diary of what happened in every class, what was happening even while it was happening. And that notebook uh, is reprinted as the middle section of this book, which I hope you will all have in your hands uh, by this evening. Uh, I started with a notebook that I wrote in 1945, but then I realized that if I publish it, unfortunately, most people, even most theater people in New York and in America, uh, don't know much about Erwin Piscotter. We do know much about Brecht, with whom we worked together, because Brecht left a body of scripts. But the work of the director uh, before the time when everything was filmed uh, was uh, uh, ephemeral. And much of what he was and what he taught us has been lost. <clears throat> but when I started uh, to edit those notes, I realized I would have to say something about who Piscotta was and the work that he did in the Weimar Republic uh, with Brecht. And uh, so I wrote the first part of this book as a kind of a historical story of where he came from and where I came from. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Then there's a third part of the book, which takes place after Piscotter leaves the United States and returns to Germany, a very difficult period in his life, 11 years of wandering from city to city, doing wonderful plays in each city, and spreading the seeds of his um, uh, of his theory and of his practice in 11 different places in Germany. And then when Willy Brandt became the mayor of Berlin, he gave him back the keys to the Volksbühne, his old theater, and he began to do the work that he had always promised he would do if he had a theater of his own. He needed that. Uh, he needed that theater of his own all his life. He never really wanted to be a teacher, though he was a very good teacher, and those of us who attended his school uh, gained much from it. He wanted to be a director, and as soon as he had a theater of his own, he directed and produced the three seminal political plays of our, our time. Uh, the investigation, the case of J. Robert Oppenheim, and the deputy, and the deputy right. And uh, he uh, fulfilled his promise that he would reinvent modern political theater uh, if he had a theater, and he did that before his death. And then the last part of the book is about the influence that he has had on all theater, and for that matter, on all art. And uh, I hope you will uh, uh, look into that because it's an interesting part of our history and our life today. <coughs> I would like to read to you two sections of my book. 
the first I'm going to read now is a rather amusing anecdotal story of how I came to the dramatic workshop and uh, uh, what it felt like to enter that world. And uh, the last part I will read at the end of this program uh, some of Piscotter's own, he didn't write, he didn't write anything down, but he spoke marvelously and I tried to write as fast as I could to catch as much of I, as I could of his meaning and his words. And I will read that at the end of today's program. And uh, that's very serious stuff. Uh, this is the uh, earlier part, <coughs> uh, which I call my personal struggle to enter the dramatic workshop. I entered the dramatic workshop five years after it was created. 1945 was the year the Second World War ended. The dreadful ordeal that had drained everyone's energy and filled us with fears was over. It was a time when fear gave way to hope and to a, hero and a, and to a rhetoric of optimism and a poetry of optimism. It wasn't easy for me to attend the dramatic workshop. My father's death from leukemia in 1940 had left me and my mother penniless and tuition was a thousand dollars. I applied for and was eventually given a scholarship to cover half of it and I had to earn $500 to cover the other half. I worked at two jobs. <coughs> I had a daytime job at Consolidated Laundries where I did the worst work, opening the bags and counting the dirty wash and dealing with all the other filth that people stuff into their laundry bags. Don't do that. <laughs> and I took a nighttime job too as a waitress, singer, and hat check girl at Valeska Gertz Beggar Bar. Now, Valeska Gert was the innovative, grotesque tensorin of Berlin, of the avant-garde in the 1920s, and an inspiration to the Expressionists. She often boasted that it was from her and from her gestures that Mayakovsky derived the style of his constructivist theater. She, too, had fled the cultural darkness of fascism. And in a cellar on the corner of Morton and Bleecker Street, in the very heart of Greenwich Village, she created a cabaret in a tiny cellar painted black with the ambience of a Berliner Kneipe of the 1920s, but without a liquor license. Valeska, who had famously played the role of Polly Peachum in Pop's film of Brecht's Three Penny Opera, named her cabaret The Beggar Bar. And here she performed an extraordinary repertoire of solo satires. While I worked at the two roles, the two jobs, that I was, prepare, I was preparing my scholarship audition for the workshop. Influenced by Valeska's performance, I created a dance drama enacting my poem, Lunar Bowels, about a voyage to the moon, or the risks of venturing into the great unknown. It was a very physical performance. I was to perform first for Maria Lepescatter, who received me in a blue velvet gown in her blue mirrored office. It was Madame's blue period. Uh, I came to her with great trepidation, but she responded favorably to my surreal piece. I leaped about the blue office shamelessly as only an 18-year-old would dare to do and with as much bizarre vocalization as I could borrow from Valeska Gertz's shrieks and whispers, along with the memory 
of a scratchy record my mother loved to play of her favorite actor, Alexander Moise, also Piscotter claimed his favorite actor. I cried out, my foot upon the moon, my foot upon the slippery moon, and I slid across the blue carpet until I struck a mirrored wall, ungravitated, dance and leap a hundred feet, and it seemed a hundred feet as I jumped as high as I could and landed face down on Madame's blue carpet until my body, bones alone, left now rattles in the moon like dice in a big hand, and I flung myself, shaken by spasms, around the blue office. Madame approved my unlikely audition and authorized me to perform it again for Piscata the following week. But that week, there happened to be a crisis at Valeska Gertz Beggar Bar, and it was suddenly closed by the authorities for being a cabaret without a liquor license. Valeska served an eggnog concoction that was sold, bottled in grocery stores and had a slight taint for flavor of alcohol. <laughs> My friend and fellow waiter, who went by the stage name of Françoise Lasseur and was in fact the person who first brought me to Valeska's was arrested for serving the eggnog. I vehemently urged Valeska to pay his bail bond since none of us, including Valeska, had any idea that we were doing anything illegal and she reluctantly agreed to bail him out of jail. And then Lasseur vanished forever from New York City and Valeska was stuck with the full bail, usually 10 times the amount of the bond. All this happened the week of my audition for Piscator, uh, when I was terrified of meeting the great man after years of hearing his praises sung. And now, at last, I held my breath as the door to Piscata's office upstairs opened and suddenly it was Valeska Gert who came out of the door. Piscata behind her and seeing me, she shrieked in her wildest, grotesque voice, there she is! She is the one! She made me pay the bail! She made me lose all my money! It's all her fault! Apparently Valeska had gone to Piscata to ask for some financial help during the Lasseur crisis. And by the looks of it, he had refused her. And I feared it was the end of all my hopes. In his cold, dignified manner, he ushered me into his office, ignoring the shouts of Aleska. But I was shaken. Carter's office was quite the opposite of Madame's romantic room. It was the book-filled and paper-strewn office, and behind the desk was a large map of the theater of war, and he had placed colored pins to denote the battlefields. How beautiful he was, his noble silver head, like the idealized sculpture of a Roman emperor, proud, authoritative, patriarchal, wise. This was the office of a political man. Nothing here was theatrical, dr dramatic, yes, but only in the sense that war is dramatic. In front of his Spartan desk, I danced out my moon poem, and it seemed less outrageous following Valeska's hysterical outburst. Piscata was pleased, and I won my scholarship to the dramatic workshop. We're going to perform a few scenes from History of the World through this last play, which we performed for two months this winter.
democracy which led to the French Revolution. And then, and then, and then... Hold on! It is, uh, it is a living pleasure on several levels to be here again. Um, I was uh, a student in Maria's uh, school, which was for young people. And I remember very distinctly when I told my mother I wanted to be an actor, she said, do you? And about two weeks later, she brought me to a brownstone right on this block, about two or three doors down. And there in the living room was Erwin and Maria. And I don't remember anything else, except that it was very awe-inspiring. And I was struck by the atmosphere. Um, and um, that's wonderful picture that you saw, this photo. Uh, there was a photo of, um, of, er of Erwin standing at the edge of the stage, which was, for me, how the way I remember him, standing at the edge of the stage and watching the production with an intensity and, an, and a focus. And I remember somebody told me, hey, uh, you know, we want to uh, tell uh, Irving, the Irwin, that uh, uh, w we need to get into this rehearsal room uh, at 5 o'clock. Would you go tell him that? And, of course, they knew. Uh, <laughs> I think they were playing a little trick on me uh, because I had never dared sp speak to him at all. But I... I got up my courage, and he was standing there watching the rehearsal. And I think finally, finally, I, I waited for there to be a pause. And I went up and I said something. I don't remember what. And he turned very quietly and said, yes, I know, in a moment. Um, he had a way that was, uh, really, it was, you could only say, like, uh, somebody who knew everything about what he knew. Uh, there was no way that you could ever suggest something to Urban Piscotter. But the first time that I was in a class with Maria, uh, she brought out a book of an actor prepares and she looked, uh, she turned sort of at random to the middle of the book and she said, yes, today I think we shall try, uh, wait a moment, 
yes, I know what we will do. And so, and I said to myself, I was like 12 years old, and I said, she's reading from the book. Doesn't she know? Uh, uh, she's going to make it up? Uh, so, so I was born with a sort of natural skepticism. Um, but then I began to play things, and then I met Judith on stage when we did a performance at the theater uptown, the President Theater, as it was called, and later became Mama Leone's. And, um, mm -hmm. of course. And, um, and we did uh, uh, two plays. We were in uh, Pinocchio. Uh, I played Pinocchio, and, and, and uh, Judith played the cat. <laughs> and, and, um, and then uh, uh, we did a play called uh, The Prince Who Learned Everything Out of Books. I played the prince, and Judith played, I don't know what it was that you played. Um, but then I saw Judith in Jean-Paul Sartre's The Flies, and it was unforgettable. And I remember Judith in her uh, see-through leotard, uh, black, uh, her wings and her leotard, and the, and the production. And then I saw uh, All the King's Men about Huey Long with a stage that was uh, constructed like the uh, Tower of Babel. Uh, and at the top of it was a desk and a phone, and they were both slanted like this. And I mean, it, it, it was the most amazing, amazing, amazing uh, uh, wedding of idea and art together. And well, that's one of the things that I think, one of the reasons I think Judith is uh, really uh, probably the best student he ever, ever, ever had because he, she took everything that he taught, everything that he innovated, and she made it her own. When I saw the first uh, the production of The Connection, a uh, lightning uh, theatrically struck me. I said, I've got to become a member of this company. My God, this is incredible. And of course, you know, when you, as you all know, uh, when you went into the lobby, uh, uh, one of the jazz musicians came up to you and said, hey man, I, I really, I, I know I gotta get something, man. I gotta, I gotta go. I can't go, do, I can't go to the show unless I get a fix. I gotta go out and get a fix. You know, can you give me just five, five, you know? And I said, Jesus, I, I could not tell whether he was an actor or, you know, was it for real? And this is the brilliant thing that I always noticed in Judas Productions. She had actors who were the most wonderfully trained and, and uh, excellent uh, professional actors, actors who've been in the theater for 20 years, along with actors who had obviously not acted, but were completely committed to the vision of the director. And so there was a wonderful synthesis on stage. And, 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 and I remember one of the actors, I, 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 I have to say his name again, um, uh, po Poach wrote, what? Henry Poach. Henry it, this man was absolutely amazing. He lived at home with his mother in, in, in Brooklyn, for, I think for all of his life. He was in his 45 or 50 when I saw him on stage. He, you, when he was on stage, you could not look at anybody else. And yet he was a complete amateur, the best amateur in the best sense, that you do it for the love of doing it. So I just want to tell, I just want to say the best way to introduce anybody is to tell a couple of stories. And I, and I would like very much of Judith, uh, when the time comes later, that you will tell the story of your mother and the handkerchief, okay? You know that story? It's the first time I heard the story recently. It is, is an amazing theater story. And also, the, this is a little story about Piscotter. Um, when he was in the war and at the front, and it's funny because um, somebody said the same thing I was gonna say. There was a lull in the fighting and he got into a conversation with an officer, and he told the officer his ideas 
about life and philosophy and, and the world and everything. And finally the officer looked at him and said, you know, you're a very interesting young man. Uh, what do you do in civilian life? And he thought, my God, I can't say that I'm an actor. He won't take me seriously. I'm a director. <laughs> and I, th you know, there's sometimes it's the little anecdotes in life that turns you into who you are or what you become. And um, sometimes very frequently by accident. Uh, and anyway, that, I think he realized that he could get to people through his through the passion that he had for everything by being a director. And so this is one of the ways that we become who we are. So, Judith, thank you. Thank you. That was, of course, George Bartenieff, longtime living theater company member, was in the original cast of The Brig, which also, of course, changed many lives. Um, you know, Judith and I were at Barney Rossett's memorial yesterday, and somebody there said something that I want to repeat, and that's that there should be more young people here at this. And, and I don't mean that despairingly, I mean that in the hopes and in very much in the beliefs that this book that Judith has given all of us is Theater 101 and that there will be droves of young people that will get these messages and it will be heard and, and even though they're not here tonight, and that's New York City is a very attractive place to go out in, so it's understandable that they're not, but they will be, they will be. So I'm here to read Richard Schechner's forward. You know, you got Richard Schechner, Piscata, Molina, what else do you need if you're a theater student? Where, what else are you doing? Anyways, um, really, it's really, it's something. It's, it's a moment in history, this book. It really explains a missing link in American culture and the culture that eventually became rock and roll culture that eventually that stemmed out of the beats and the jazz movement. And it's really a moment here. It's, when I read this book, I, Judith's husband had just had a stroke, Hannon, and I read it at her bedside, and I just thought, how on earth is this not one of the most heroic stories in theater history? And, and I think that's what we're doing now is we're, we're making that known. So this is Richard Schechner's forward. It's, it's remarkable. I'll just cut right to it. He says, the thing about Judith Molina is that she is indefatigable, unstoppable, erupting with ideas. Molina is long living, long working, optimistic, and by the second decade of the 21st century, girlish and old womanish at the same time. She survives and she bubbles both. Melina and Julian Beck founded The Living in New York in 1947. Yes, you heard me right. And as I write this in December 2011, The Living is still going strong. The Living is Melina, but it is also in excess of Melina. The Living includes Molina's life partners, post-designer, actor, Beck, who just died in 1985, and director, playwright, Hannon Resnikoff, who passed away in 2008, who after seeing Paradise Now at Yale in 1968, decided to join The Living, which he later did in the 70s. Over the 65 years of its existence, so many performers, Rufus Collins, Stephen Ben Israel, Nona Howard, Carl Barber, Carl Einhorn, Diana Von Tosh, Mary Mary, Joseph Chaikin, Soraya Bruchim, all of the actors of the modern company. You can just read their names in our programs. Oh, it's not my place to list them all, the hundreds of performers, or the writers who, whose plays and poems so affected the living, even as the living took apart their texts to make something new. William Carlos Williams, Gertrude Stein, Jack Gelber, Kenneth H. Brown, Bertolt Brecht, Frederica Garcia Lorca, Sophocles, Mary Shelley, and the participating audiences who, for a time, joined the living on stages and then followed the living into the streets. No, to list them all would take up a big wall. And anyway, the living is not to be carved on any monument. The living's flag is the black banner of anarchy, 
sometimes toned red with communism, puffed high by weed, twisted by acid, a neo-tribe shouting poetry, raging against the lunacies of authority, loving enemies and friends too, to death, spitting scorn, and then unexpectedly going soft and forgiving, embracing, and inviting you, yes, you, come with us, join us, and many did. Before there was the living, there was Judith Molina, the student of Erwin Piscotter. Who was this Piscotter, and what did he teach Molina? Today, Piscotter is not so much remembered in his own right, but as someone who influenced Bertolt Brecht. Brecht took the idea of epic theater from Piscotter, who had adapted it from the playwright Arnold Bronin, a friend of Brecht's. Epic theater was a reaction against the bourgeois sentimentality of naturalism. This strong response against Stanislavski, as expressed in the art of Meyerhold and Mayakovsky, permeated the early years of the Russian Revolution. Then Piscotter's productions at Berlin's Volksbühne treated topical, historical, factual material with fluidity, simultaneity, and cinematic cutting. Piscotter wanted the theater to explode out of the theater buildings into the streets, to take from real life and surge back into real life. It was this theory and practice that Piscotter brought with him to New York, where he started the dramatic workshop in 1940. The workshop's faculty included Maria Leigh Piscotter, Erwin's wife, Lee Strasberg, Stella Adler, Herbert Berghoff, and John Gassner. Among the students were Harry Belafonte, Marlon Brando, George Barteniev, Rod Steger, Walter Matthau, Tennessee Williams, and Judith Molina. Piscotter's approach resonated with Molina. As she writes in her notebook, Monday, February 5th, 1945, on my first day as a student of the theater, I had the rare experience of meeting a great man. When Erwin Piscotter entered the room, it was not the spontaneous applause of my fellow students alone that I felt, but the tangible presence of personality. He said that the great revolutions were often inspired by plays of high impact, like Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, or Gerhard Hauptmann's The Weavers. His informality, combined with the fire and power of his ideas, led to him making the half-joking statement which I am tempted to use as my motto. The theater is the most important thing, and anyone who does not realize this is stupid. <laughs> Molina was 19 when she wrote these words. Piscata, 52. Born in Kiel, Germany, Molina's family moved to New York in 1928 because her father, founder of New York's German Jewish congregation, foresaw the horror that was to be Hitler's Reich. And now our associate artistic director, Tom Walker, is going to do an interview with Judith to ask her some timely questions, and maybe she'll get to George's favorite story. It's one of my favorites, too. It's really, it's yet another one of those untold legends that this is all a part of, Rabbi Max Molina. So thank you for your time, and thank you to Richard Schechner. Thank you. <coughs> so we'll... Hello? Yeah. Hello. We'll do the Charlie Rose section. Um, I'm going to ask Judith four questions, one about the 40s, one about the 50s, one about the 60s, and one about the 70s up until the present. And maybe you'll work in the handkerchief. But um, in 1945, you were a young woman of 19. The world had been convulsed by the world war. The atom bomb had exploded. The Holocaust had happened. Your grandfather had been killed in front of your grandmother's eyes in 1938 in Kiel, and miraculously your, your father pulled strings and got your grandmother out of Germany. You'd even seen Germany in 1936 on a little trip to visit the relatives. Uh, so in 1945, it was this brave new world, and I just uh, would like you to, to talk a bit about how you saw yourself in this, in this crazy, crazy moment. Well. Uh George Bargeniev asked me to tell the story 
of uh, of how I really became a theater artist, and in fact, how I was destined to become a theater artist. And not all of us are so lucky, but I was so destined because uh, my father, as a German rabbi and as a philosopher, foresaw the degeneration of the morality of Germany uh, before the Nazis came and realized what was happening to the German people and uh, decided uh, to leave uh, Germany and brought us to New York. Now my mother was an actress and a very ambitious actress. Her hope and dream was to work with Erwin Piscotter, who at that time was the young, glowing hope of the Weimar Republic. And uh, when she met my father, they fell in love. And she, did, she had to give up her career, because at that time it was unthinkable that, oh, 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 uh, that a woman could be an actress and a rabbi's wife. Now you could be an actress and a rabbi. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we've made a little bit of progress. We still have a lot to go. Uh, but she gave up her career, and they decided together, my father and mother, that they would have a daughter who would be a surrogate for my mother's career. That is, that I would be the actress that my mother was not. And I was trained uh, to be that actress. When I was very young, I recited uh, uh, poetry at great rallies to stir up some interest in the American community to help out the Jewish community that was being wiped out. And I recited very sentimental poetry about German children in German. And uh, uh, I didn't realize it was political theater, but of course it was. Uh, <coughs> so actually, I was doing political theater at a very early life, point in my life. And then, when I graduated high school, Piscotter miraculously came here to America and opened the dramatic workshop. And I applied right. to study there. And you know about what followed. Right. But that handkerchief, where did the handkerchief come in? What handkerchief? George referred to a story about your mother and a handkerchief. I wonder what that, you have to tell me about that, George. Do you remember it? I remember. Counting the handkerchiefs. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. oh yes. Uh, I remember it now. Yes, I remember it, of course. Uh, uh, my political theater training consisted of my mother watching the audience when I recited German poetry that is supposed to be touching the heart. And she counted how many handkerchiefs there were in the, in the theater and would reproach me sometimes if it's a large audience and there were only five handkerchiefs. You better do better. <laughs> that is, I was trained to move people to tears. So you were... <laughs> so in some ways you were ahead of everybody. You were really deeply in that brave new world that was unfolding in the late 40s. But let's jump ahead to the 50s, because already you and Julian start your theater. And by the end of the 50s, you've become pretty well known with the theater on 14th Street and the connection. So you had made your mark already in the theater. Were you in touch at all with Piscotter in those years in the 50s? Uh, I was in touch with Piscotter through my mother all my life, because my mother uh, idolized Piscotter as a child and taught me 
And this was the great theater man. So when I approached him, of course, I approached him with great awe. Uh, and I was not disappointed. Uh, certainly he had a great deal to teach us and still has a great deal to teach us. But did you hear about his doings in Germany or were you in touch with him through Maria Lay? Well, I, was, I became very close friends with Maria, uh, uh, especially after he returned to, to Europe, to Germany. Because she remained here. She remained here and continued the dramatic workshop and she lived a very long life. And at 101, she was still talking about establishing dramatic workshop two, which she never did. But I like to think that the living theater has taken some of that energy and those ideas of using the theater uh, for a political, for a humane cause. And you taught a co course here at the New School with Maria. With Maria, yes. Briefly. Yes. Uh, in the 60s, you <coughs> had the great plays, the brig, the, 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 the connection was still running became very famous and uh, even more wildly famous in the late 60s. And you went to Europe, you the, lost the theater here, and you found yourself in Germany, you found yourself in Berlin, and you did meet Piscotter once again, didn't you? Yes, I, I, I saw uh, his last production in Germany, and uh, I have been heartbroken all my life that he never came to see a living theater production. Never saw Antigone, never, never saw Antigone, Frankenstein. Which we were playing at the time. Nearby. Nearby, near a couple of streets away. And he never came to see us. And it broke my heart. But sometimes uh, rejection is part of a love story. And, <laughs> <coughs> and in, he never did see our play. I saw his last play, I saw the uh, uh, the investigation. investigation at his theater and it was quite a marvelous production and I kept learning uh, though when he saw me come in the first thing he did was scold me he said there you are you you have so many interviews and you don't talk about my work actually <laughs> actually I did talk about his work but then they didn't print it <laughs> 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 well, Piscotter left the scene in 66, and uh, you went on and on and on from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s, from the prisons of Brazil to the big streets and piazzas of Italy and so many <coughs> cities in America and, and uh, Europe, street theater after street theater after street theater using the biomechanics of Meyerhold and audience participation, yes. much of the work has been your challenge of audience participation. Do you see this coming from Piscotter in any way? This Piscotter life? talked about audience participation all his life and encouraged audience participation, but never did it. He, was, he, he did not really trust the audience. I blame him for this. Uh, because he never, he never engaged in participatory plays. And I've tried to make up for it. The last play I did, there were no chairs. The audience came in and had to perform from beginning to end. That was the history of the world. And uh, I have examined various ways of bringing the audience uh, to participate in the action and carry on Piscata's work to the next stage. Well, that you've done. Thank you. And now we'll hear a little bit from Jack Garfine, who worked in the dramatic workshop as well. And uh, Jack, it's all yours. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. So, <clears throat> my story with Piscotter is 
a complex story, so much so that when I saw the picture here on the screen of him, I didn't think I could get up here and talk. Um, I arrived in this country at the age of 15, and I, had, I was alone. I had lost my family, and I was the only survivor of about 11 concentration camps. Of course, when I told some of the people here that I wanted to be an actor, can you imagine? I couldn't speak English. They said, oh, yeah, everybody in America wants to be an actor, Jack. What are you talking about? God, they try to talk me out of it. And then I heard about the dramatic <coughs> workshop. And um, I had no money. I had no support. Piscotta didn't know my story. I did what Judith did. I auditioned. And I got the first year's scholarship. Okay. So recently, last year, I was in a place you haven't heard of. It was one of the worst camps during the war called Flossenburg. And it was the anniversary of the liberation. I was liberated in Belzen, but just before that, I was probably the youngest in Flossenburg, so they invited me to speak. And at the end of the speech, I said, well, you know, there was this marvelous German man who I didn't even appreciate that much when I, when I saw him, not like Judith. I said, who gave me my life back, my artistic life. And someone asked me, well, what does that mean, uh, that after you've been through, you got your artistic life back? So I quoted a, a, a song of Schubert's called Andi Musik, uh, which Beckett introduced me to. He loved Schubert. You know, he had a wonderful voice, and so did James Joyce. They could have been great singers. But to paraphrase this, the song, uh, the words in the song are, Whatever difficulties, whatever pain I've gone through in my life, you, music, you demand so much of me. You involve me so that the rest disappears. And the last line is, du heilige Kunst, ich danke dir. You holy art, I thank you. In a sense, it's what Piscato gave me, but I didn't realize that until many, many years later. As you've heard, he came from a well-known Protestant family, and Goebbels offered him to be the head of the German theater because they, they, they got rid of Reinhardt because he was a Jew, and Piscotter refused, and when he arrived in New York, <laughs> you can imagine, the Broadway theater that was occupied with tickling the audience or flattering the audience, obviously shunned him. And this indefatigable director, what he did was to realize his work. Oh. Uh, used a school to realize his work. His dramatic workshop at the new school permitted him, under the school auspices, because of the collegiate banner of the school, not to worry about union contracts. So with his students, the most experienced actors, designers, uh, 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 um, uh, writers, but particularly the actors, the teachers, who were all refugees from G Germany, were able to work with inexperienced actors, with us. Okay. So, um, in a sense, the two theaters that you heard that were mentioned, the President Theater, because the school was not run at the time when I was in it. It was, 
It was the work of this man that dominated the work. It was not a school to show actors' work or to have agents wanting to, to, to see actors on, uh, real, you know, and make them into stars. It was his vision, his work, that he used the two theaters, the President Theater and the Rooftop Theater, which had an open box office, people could buy tickets. In these productions, from Shakespeare to Sartre, to the laughter of the good soldier Schweik, War and Peace, and the world premiere of All the King's Men, which only some of us realized much later that we were in the hands of a passionate, powerful voice of the theater. We didn't know that. I didn't know it, and Judith obviously did. There were some that did know that, okay. Um, but you won't find any press reports or any criticism of any of those productions, because even the critics and the press, they were school performances. They, they couldn't relate to it. And I must tell you the truth, that even with most of the students, we thought because we were brainwashed, what was not Judith, okay, what was Broadway success and Hollywood success, that we looked at Piscata as someone who had a school because he didn't make it. And I knew that somehow, he sensed it. It did not stop him from his work. My own experience with him, I did, the first, I did a number of plays that I was in as an actor and also technically, but the first time he saw me in a play, I got some nice reactions from the students. In my class, by the way, was Walter Matthau, Tony Curtis, Rod Steiger, you know. So, they praised my performance, and Rod Steiger actually called Piscata and said, you must see, I was then 17 years old, you must see this, this actor in, the, in, in this play that he's doing. So on a Saturday, Piscata shows up at the President Theater. He congratulates all the actors, comes into my dressing room. No, yeah, Garfine, yeah. <laughs> you come and see me in my office on Monday. So, you can imagine, two days without sleep, with worries, <laughs> waiting for Monday morning, okay? So, Monday morning I walk into his office and he says to me, I know they like you, you got very good comments, but listen, um, when I saw you on the stage, I saw a talent of a director, not an actor. Well, you can imagine. I was 17 years old. To me, directors were failed actors. <laughs> so I looked, I was shocked. And he, he sensed that I was shocked. So he said to me, well, let me explain to you why I said that. When you were on the stage, uh, Jack, I sense that you have a feeling when the play isn't working or isn't going and you're doing things in order to get the audience interested and involved. That's directing, not acting, okay? So, what I want you to do is, uh, you take a directing class. Well, you can continue with your acting, but the acting, you have to start all over again, okay? But, so, well, you can imagine. Uh, the next day, I was trying to figure out what form my suicide should take. <laughs> but finally, I came in tears to my teacher, Margaret Weiler. And she said, but you know, people like you as an actor. And Piscata said, you can keep on working as an actor, but it's very important to do. So my end of my first year came up, just like Judith, and I didn't know whether my scholarship will be renewed, you know. So I decided, okay, I joined a directing class by Lee Strasberg, who was a teacher there. I sat there, never directing. That was my way of protesting, okay? I just sat there until a director came to me and said, oh, I want you to act in, uh, I'm gonna do a scene from Oedipus. I want you to play the old prophet, Tiresias. I was then 17, okay, but 
okay? Acting, yes, great, I agree, okay? So now the scene is done for Strasbourg. The first thing Strasbourg says is, pointing at me, who told him what to do? The director says, I didn't tell him, he did it himself. That's the only directing touch in the entire scene. <laughs> so, and then, of course, I continued with, with, with my work as an actor, and I was very, very lucky because when Piscara did Our Town, he cast me as the little boy, as Wally. And I thought of my own family before the war. And when Wally was leaving, I remembered that in our backyard we had chickens, and so I added that to the scene. And, uh, and at the same time, he cast me as the old man going at the end to the, to the, to the church, so, to funeral. So, at, at the dress rehearsal, he was very unhappy with everybody in the cast, except he pointed to me and said, he acts better with his back than you do with all the parts. Based on that, he cast me in the lead of The Burning Bush, a play about the Tissa Esla case where the Jews were accused of using Christian blood for, pa for the Passover ritual. And it's a story of, of a boy who's an orthodox boy who the count takes in and, and, and he falls in love with the Count's daughter, and he testifies against the Jews, saying that he was a witness to that. All I can tell you is that the, the experience of being a part of that kind of a theme and that kind of a story, and then at one point I turned to Piscotter because he used music, and I said, oh, Mr. Piscotter, just remember, I was you know, 17 and a half, I said, oh, Mr. Viscar, that music sounds very Jewish. He said, yes, it's by Mahler. He was a Jew, you see. So I, I didn't realize, like most of us, not Judith and not a few others like her, didn't really realize until much later when I realized that his use of projections, of films, of, of, of slides, of sounds, of lighting, was the most poetic use of technical elements I have ever encountered. I have not encountered them since. And then, 64 years later, this happened about six or seven months ago, I wrote a book, and in the book I mentioned about the fact about, about the burning bush, and at the time, uh, I said that Stefan Zweig had written The Burning Bush. The editor who researched the stuff called me and said, Jack, Stefan Zweig never wrote a play uh, called, uh, never wrote a play called The Burning Bush. So I said, okay, leave out the name, okay? 64 years later, about eight months ago, I pick up the, I get the London Review of Books and I read about, about, uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm so uh, touched by this, uh, about Kafka. And there's a quote from Kafka. And he says, the only time I ever cried reading a play was the burning bush. And I said to myself, my God, I was in a play. Piscato put me in a play, the only play that made Franz Kafka cry. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Louise Kurz, who also was at the dramatic workshop. No, I have that wrong? It's okay. <laughs> I was not at the dramatic workshop, but my first husband, Leo Kurz, was a teacher there. The lives of my first husband, stage designer and producer Leo Kurz, and director Erwin Piscator, collaborated at three major junctions. The first was in Berlin in the late 1920s. 
Leo was a theater student at the Piscator Schule during the last days of the extraordinary cultural explosion of the Weimar Republic. He saw all of the director's modern productions, the use of film, slides, as Jack has just mentioned, the technical innovations. He inherited the philosophy of the political theater, which lasted during his entire career. After Leo Kurz fled from the Nazi regime in Berlin to Johannesburg, South Africa, and he waited for a visa to America, Erwin Piscator offered him a job at the dramatic workshop at the New School. He taught stage and costume design here because, as you probably know, one could not emigrate unless there was a job waiting. He taught costume and stage design here where Judith Molina and I think Julian were in, the, were in his classes. He was one of the several European intellectuals who shared their knowledge with young theater students in New York City. The third and last encounter was in the early 1960s, and I must say that as a witness to this, I, was, I feel very privileged that I was able to spend three months watching Erwin Piscator put together the play Der Stellvertreter, The Deputy. Leo Kurz was asked to do the sets and costumes, and we went to Berlin in 1962. Piscator was given his final tribute by his countrymen when he was given the theater, as Judith described, the Freie Volksbühne, the People's Theater. And he asked Leo to design the sets and costumes of a very important play. It was so controversial, it was written by a young German author, Rolf Hochhut, who questioned Pope Pius's silence during the Holocaust. It was a very, very personal moment for Leo because his parents and sister died at Sobibor. The play was fraught with problems. The Vatican lawyers and the Krupp family wanted to sue and stop the production, and others protested. Mayor Willy Brandt assured Piscator that the play would open, and it did with police protection all over the theater and around the streets. On the opening night, German audiences wept because for the first time they saw a play which explored the entire Nazi period. At the end, there was silence, and then a 20-minute ovation for the creative team. So there was Erwin Piscator linking hands with his former student, Leo Kurz. They had collaborated on a play which represented the philosophies and high standards that encompassed Piscator's work, who was really a political detective, also exploring social and political conventions. Tonight, I salute Judith Molina and her journals. She, too, is now holding hands with Erwin Piscator. I wanted to mention that in those last months when Urban Piscator finally got the kind of recognition that he deserved in Berlin. He had a beautiful apartment on the Kurfürstendamm, which was completely covered with large photo montages of his great productions. The Good Soldier Schweig, um, uh, and various other things. And he was a very happy man. His stature had improved again. He had a gymnasium in his apartment, and he liked to show people how he could hang from bars up like that. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the success of the deputy uh, provided a great road for the four or five other plays that followed uh, before he died. The investigation, the case of J. Robert Oppenheimer, which was done at Lincoln Center and was a fabulous production with Herbert Berghoff. Anyway, I salute Judith. I love what she does, and I'm so glad that she was in Leo's class. Thank you. Now Judith will read another passage. 
yes, I wanted to. I wanted to end with some of the words that I remember Piscator saying. As I say, I kept this notebook, all of which is now included in the book that we are whose publication, thanks to Rutledge, we are celebrating today. And I want to read this passage uh, because uh, it's my attempt to quote directly uh, what Piscotter said. Tuesday, April 3rd, 1945. <coughs> it took place right here, and Piscotter was standing right there when he said these words. In theater research class today, Mr. Piscotter spent two hours talking about his political theater. It was one of the most inspiring lectures, and I tried to write down the essence of what Mr. Piscotter said. Uh, remember his language, uh, his first language was not English, and therefore uh, some of the uh, sentences here have a Germanic twist, uh, though he spoke very beautifully, even in English. Art in itself seems a beautiful accomplishment of life, even when it does not criticize life. We begin with the question of how art should be used, and from this follows the question, how should life be used? Can we make progress in life, or only in certain scientific discoveries? Is man little, or is he big? Piscata uh, was of a time when the word man was used generically for men and women. We don't do that anymore. Uh, is man little, or is he big? For what purpose has he created something greater than himself? Uh, some X, or some God? We die, children of 70 years. We conquer nothing. Art is conquered out of the universe, out of that in man which is greater than himself. Art goes beyond the walls where even our brains cannot go. Not even genius. Genius? Is it a sickness? A deformation of the individual? Genius and insanity are balanced on a knife blade. Lenin called the idea of God into question. We have turned back to what we see. We know that other things exist, but what we see is organizable. Society, justice, and an end to wars. Shall we reach as men what we have thought as men since the beginning, since Plato and Christ? But the doubters say, who gives me my next piece of butter? The victors are the powerful who make wars, and the others are the masses. Both art for art's sake and art with an aim. Start with the question, can we progress or shall we be driven by unknown forces, by Christ's fantastic teaching, by God, by that revolutionary book, the Bible? There is betrayal everywhere. From the drugstore to the new school, as he stood right here saying that, from the drugstore to the new school, the Pope in the Vatican wears good clothes. Christ is a bestseller who asks for eternal peace. We kill 1,000 people with a single shot. The realists say, at least we are on the right side. One knew about Iowa, but not about Iwo Jima. 4,000 men died 
And now we know about Iwo Jima. This is progress. The crosses in the Strasbourg Cemetery are progress. 13 million died in the last war, and perhaps 30 million in this one. Progress. Behind all this, the XYZ power, God. While Venus de Milo and Parsifal below us in the dirt are unlooked at, that's progress. The realists hold that art is above life. Let the people come out of their darkness to see beauty and art in theaters and museums. Then let them return to their dirt. The dirt is unchangeable. Thus speak the realists. But there are those who say, we need not separate life and art. Life in itself is art. Let us build life in an artful way till we need no art. Art may seem as an excuse for our imperfections. The human spirit can build at its highest points manifestations of the spirit, cathedrals, the Acropolis. But we cannot build the pillars of the Acropolis today. Although the Bank of Athens is built to the exact same measurements as the Acropolis, the spirit is lacking. The harmony of spirit and technique we made of art a special thing as we did of religion. Religion became an institution and the spirit flew out. The spirit flew out when we divided art and society. <clears throat> Can we build society like an eight-cylinder car by understanding its elements? Can we do this without considering spiritual form which governs human happiness, spiritual meaning, growth and intelligence? We need art to complete the incompleteness of life. But first we need society and security in society. And we must take a step toward this in our theater. Political theater is art theater. There are those who say that theater is not art because it is programmatic in form. In music and painting, one can be abstract or sheerly beautiful, but the theater is thoughtful. Every word opens a world of thought with an analysis of thought the art theater was always bound to thinking and always seeking for truth. Thus, the art theater was always a political theater. The theater turns, even unconsciously, to politics. How can we build the positive? After the disastrous war from 1914 to 1918, the struggle for clarity began, and our political theater began. Rembrandt, uh, uh, Reinhardt continued the beautiful theater. But we returned to the theater to fight. We must make art that is conscious, clarify, like Lear in the storm, his revolutionary cries unheeded. Only once, in Brussels, a revolution started in a theater. When La Muette del, des Portici was given at the Théâtre de la Monnaie, and the audience stormed out of the theater and started the revolution that liberated Belgium from the Dutch. But today, not only the high admission prices, but also the absence of spirit prevents us from realizing a people's theater. 
the money, the ideology, and the spirit are in the hands of another class. And in the midst of this stupidity, we have war, art, <coughs> art, conscious art, political art, needs the necessity and the desire for change. To understand this, we must remain objective. If we are drawn in, we no longer think. The war movies upset us with how many dead people lie all around, and still the hero gets the girl. The real causes of war must be made clear to move an audience to action. Romain Roland said, action springs from the spectacle of action. The political theater exists to take the theater out of political argument into political action. But we do not arise. We do not move. All the action of the world is in this room. We must face up to this fact. Then art conquers art. For our art is our life. It is no longer an outside thing. Then we can conquer by wisdom and bring art back to beauty. This is the point. Political theater is for me the only theater. There are some who would demean the art theater. Why build a love story and then construct a special implication around it? No. We must build a case, clarify it, build around it. Epic theater has no enclosure. It is complete. The word politics comes from the Greek polis meaning the whole city, all the surroundings, every event has a relation to the case. I used all I had. I said that the actor must demonstrate the film, use film, use design, use the audience to describe the impact of a story. We have not reached the beginning of that yet in theater. In the French Revolution, the theater failed its mission. Those are the ancestors of our political theater. We should study the theater in two ways, technically and to give content to it. Study in our age and time should lead us to the problem of content so that these problems might lead us to greatness. He who wants nothing is nothing. We are as great as our cause. Art grows only under the sun of idealism. The ancient Greeks called it the perfection. If you are not married to your art, your art is dead. We have the use of the room for an hour. Please hang out, see the books, maybe buy one. We can take credit cards. Uh, Judith will sit up here and sign them for you. And also, I want to urge you to consider our fundraising campaign run by the organization Lucky Ant. There are leaflets out there. We're trying to make $24,000 in another five days. We're almost halfway there. And this will enable us to reorganize our 
finances and pay the rent. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming.